climate change is about to upend the corporate world like never before. Massive devastation. It was a firestorm. Go, 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 go. Heavy regulation. The world's worst emitting companies, even the worst medium emitting companies, are on borrowed time. And lots more litigation. PG&E's billion dollar payout. On Volkswagen pleading guilty in Detroit for cheating on emissions rules. COVID-19 has highlighted the perils of failing to prepare. If businesses refuse to change, we will go the way of the dinosaur. There's ash that is falling. Staving off the catastrophe of climate change requires a rewiring of the entire global economy. This spells huge opportunities for some. The economic opportunity of this green revolution is not less than the original industrial revolution. But can the corporate world react and adapt in time? Climate change is like cancer. The longer you wait, the worse your chances are. We're driving through downtown St. Helena, and you can see the smoke in people's headlights. The smoke is so thick, it's like a dense fog. Lisa McKelly is a scientist who advises businesses on the impact of wildfires caused by climate change. Within the past few weeks, four out of California's five biggest recorded wildfires have smothered this famous wine-growing region with ash and smoke. The fire stops here. Oh. On the other side of the tree. Today, Lisa is advising Dan Petrosky, winemaker at Larkmead Vineyards, on how to reduce its exposure to risks. It looks like you had a lot of damage down there. Just three days ago, fire burned right up to the edge of these vineyards. And that's what I call a hazard buoy. So what was it like when you first headed towards Larkmead? There were five fire trucks on the other side of this, uh, the river here. It, it was the heaviest smoke I've been part of, uh, stinging my eyes. Also that, that night, a, the a power line went down and hit my car, and that's when I put out a fire over by the winery, and that's when I burned my boots. Let's see those boots. These are... Uh... <laughs> so the rubber on the bottom of my uh, soles of my boots were... Well, this was actually a fire at Larkmead uh, on the property. How high do you think the flames got here? There were actually flames straight up. Um, there was one that looked like it was just like super ominous. It was by itself, and it was just like a lonely tree with just a, a straight fire line. Well, this is a great example, too, of a, a place that is burned, but if another fire was to start, there's plenty left that could burn again. For Larkmead, this fire was a narrow escape. But in a state that produces 86% of America's wine, many other businesses have not been so lucky. 8,000 structures have been lost and nearly 30% of the county of Napa has been consumed in the 2020 fire season. We are dealing with constant power shutoffs during the fire weather to try to avoid fires from starting. So this, of course, is hitting a community that's had two years of fires and then the COVID crisis. And so our local businesses are struggling to stay alive. Temperatures in excess of 35 Celsius spoil grapes and force vineyards to shut down. Just over a century ago, Napa County hit these temperatures on average six days a year. Now, that figure is 33 days. The average temperature of the planet has already risen by almost one degree Celsius since 1970. Climate models suggest that if this reaches two degrees, the world's existing wine-growing region will shrink by 56%. Although I was exposed to the concept of climate change early in my career, I never thought that the impacts we were projecting would come to pass in my lifetime. Our computer models said, oh, well, maybe it'll happen at the end of the century, you know, 2050, 2060, but we're here in 2020, and we're seeing some of the worst-case scenarios come to pass. 
The physical risks to businesses from climate change stretch far beyond the industry of winemaking. 25th named storm of the season. It is the earliest J-named storm in history. Across the planet, businesses of all kinds are facing growing disruption from more extreme floods and storms. Research suggests that climate change could cost 215 big global firms a collective $1 trillion, much of this over the next five years. Rich Sorkin is the co-founder of a leading data analytics company, which advises firms on how to mitigate these risks. The business community is facing more risk from the weather driven by climate change than ever before. The statistics on this are crystal clear. The financial loss from weather-related events is at record levels, and the impact has been devastating. To protect societies and their businesses from the worst effects of climate change, more funds are needed for adaptive measures, from floating farms and storm-resilient seeds to pop-up seawalls. According to one estimate, around $180 billion of investment is required each year over the next decade. If you look 10 years forward, there won't be a single large entity on the planet, commercial or government, that uh, doesn't have a well-thought-out approach to assessing and addressing physical risks from climate change. It looks a bit like cybersecurity did 10 years ago, where businesses, by and large, were just starting to realize there was an issue, but didn't know what to do about it, didn't have the tools to address it. Now, every major entity on the planet has a well-thought-out cybersecurity program. While they struggle to adapt to the changing physical environment, companies also face a changing regulatory landscape. And recent developments in the world's two most polluting countries mean this could come quicker than expected. In the battle to save our planet by getting climate under control. China is the world's largest polluter, but it's now vowed to go carbon neutral. The world's carbon emissions have jumped in the past three decades by more than 60%. Over 70% of this pollution can be traced back to just 100 companies, mostly through the products they sell, such as oil or coal. Leading climate scientist Gavin Schmidt argues that governments will soon find there is no option but to heavily increase regulation on businesses. Some companies have uh, as large a carbon footprint as, as, as some small countries, right? So, so they have, I think, an equal responsibility uh, to, to try and do something about the problem. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's all well and good trying to get Somalia to change its, its policies, but it's irrelevant in terms of carbon. Uh, but if you can get Walmart to change its policies, or Apple, or Google, uh, then you can do something much more fundamental. Progress has been slow since the 2015 International Paris Agreement to keep global warming below two degrees. The UN climate champion responsible for working with business believes it's time to force the pace. So collectively, we're not moving fast enough. Collectively, we don't have enough policy ambition. Um, and collectively, we don't have enough business ambition. This is going to be regulated. And you can't just wait until the regulations come and then start changing it. There is pressure on governments to bring in regulation of the corporate world now. It's coming from consumers and climate activists. And it's the focus of this Extinction Rebellion protest in London. Economic interests are prepared to sacrifice your long-term future for their short-term profit. I think primarily everyone is here protesting today because there's a real sense of being let down. Chidiyoti Obihara is a former banker who is now Extinction Rebellion's spokesperson on banks and the economy. It's profoundly important to bring pressure to bear on those larger players to change their practice and set a good example that everyone else can follow. Greenpeace are involved, um, Friends of the Earth are involved. There are several 
parties got together to say, how do we make the government actually keep to its promise? Yeah. They declared a climate change emergency, and since then, you know, nothing's happened. Like many, Extinction Rebellion argues one policy is crucial, forcing businesses to come clean about their levels of emissions. Lots of banks and lots of people want to see firms show the world their real and full carbon footprint. And trying to make that happen as quickly as possible, as openly as possible, is something that XR is fighting for. But businesses refuse to change. We will go the way of the dinosaur. We will lose our habitats and potentially lose our lives in numbers. And that's why groups like us are here, asking government to facilitate a business environment that forces businesses to change if need be, because the stakes are so high. What that change will look like is an obligation for companies to measure, as well as disclose their own emissions. Nicolette Bartlett is director of an international non-profit, which advises corporations on how to do this. The world's worst emitting companies, even the worst medium emitting companies, are on borrowed time. Carbon is very, very costly to society. At some point, that will hit their bottom line. It's guaranteed. So it is a big risk if you're not seeing it, measuring it, reporting it, and changing your business practice. Most businesses are not prepared for this transition. Only 16% of listed companies currently calculate and disclose their own carbon footprint. I think it's becoming harder for companies to greenwash. I think more and more because of this transparency, the investor world has really woken up to this. The central banks have really woken up to this. Consumers have really woken up to this, and actually during COVID even more so. It's not a marginal issue anymore, it's front and centre. It's very difficult for companies to hide. But some big corporations are now jumping before they're pushed and making big decarbonising pledges. Microsoft has made a major climate pledge, promising to go carbon negative. Amazon will be one of the first companies, if not the first company, to meet the Paris Climate Accords 10 years early. What we've seen is, even in the last year, a doubling of commitments from companies, right? And they range. They, they may make a claim around going to be carbon neutral, or they'll make a claim around, I'm going to be net zero by a certain date. The task of delivering on these pledges is daunting. Firms will have to disclose not just the emissions they produce, but also those from their supply chains, which on average are over five times bigger. That's a tall order for the likes of Walmart. It's promised to cut a billion tonnes of emissions between 2017 and 2030, covering 100,000 suppliers across the world. Its supply chain is massive. It's a very bold target. So the next 10 years are going to be critical. I would argue that maybe now some of the, the lower hanging fruit, the easier stuff has been done in that supply chain. It's going to take a huge effort across all of those supply chains. It's absolutely critical that you are able to cover your entire value chain. Ultimately, it's the world's most polluting companies that will be hit hardest by carbon regulation and will have to make the most drastic changes to survive. In South Yorkshire in Britain, once an industrial heartland, heavy industries like coal mining have died out. But at this steel plant in Rotherham, climate change has provided a seemingly unlikely opportunity for rejuvenation. Through radical green adaptation. It's almost God's power in your hands, right? It's such an awesome feeling. Now, they're recycling steel here. According to the CEO, this has halved the company's emissions in Britain and cut costs. For the UK, it's a no-brainer. For the UK, it is absolutely, definitely cheaper to recycle steel than to make new steel. Uh, UK exports 8, 9 million tons of steel scrap already, and we export steel scrap and import steel, which was made no sense at all. So our model was based on recycling local steel scrap for the local market, which was a better economic model. For the long term, the CEO says the company is investing in green steel, which uses hydrogen to dramatically reduce emissions, even though it could be two decades before this technology is commercially viable. 
Hydrogen is like renewables, it's only just really starting its journey now. As we make more and more hydrogen, that technology will become cheaper and cheaper. The same way as wind and solar technology, were very expensive 10 years ago, and they become more and more competitive as we've adopted more and more scale and as technology has developed. This journey to green still is inevitable. And there lies a strong incentive for businesses to adapt to climate change. It could actually be good business in the long run. Those who invest now in expensive decarbonisation may steal a march on the competition. We know how industrial transformation takes place. It always happens exponentially. Um, and those who get the wrong side of the curve can never catch up. And we see newcomers, right, who, who, who bet the farm on that transition um, becoming the new um, industrial titans. This penny has dropped for some fossil fuel companies in an industry where profits could fall from $39 trillion to $14 trillion by 2050. The Danish company Orsted has doubled its share value by completely ditching oil in favour of renewables. This building that we're sitting in, it's not just about the energy it's uses to keep us warm or cool, or to put the lights on, but it's also about the materials that made this building. Is it more expensive at the beginning? Yes, but is that going to be a market for the future? 100%. So I would say it's logical, visionary business practice. But if the carrot of long-term profits doesn't incentivize companies to go green, there's a stick that might force more hands in the future. The growing legal risks of failing to adapt to climate change have been highlighted by one utility company in California. Well, today PG&E is expected to plead guilty to involuntary manslaughter for the utility's role in the deadly campfire. In 2019, Pacific Gas and Electric pleaded guilty to one count of illegally starting a fire and 84 counts of involuntary manslaughter, the deadliest corporate crime successfully prosecuted in America. PG&E power lines have helped start over 1,500 wildfires in the past six years. In a region where rising temperatures caused by climate change have increased the risks around fires, courts have concluded the company failed to invest in maintaining their equipment. And back in the wine country of Napa Valley, local businesses have paid the price. When the doors burned, the wine burned behind it, so I lost about almost 17,000 bottles of wine here in this tunnel here. One of them is the White Rock Vineyard, owned by Christopher Vandenreich and his family. This is my dad, Henry. He uh, um, started this, uh, this version of White Rock in the 70s when he replanted the vineyards. This is one of the bottles that partially burned in the fires. When you see that smoke coming in, uh, it's a very visceral feeling. It's horrible and um, traumatic. In 2017, fires burn down every structure on their property. I think that there, there needs to be a culture change at PG&E in order to do a better job of maintaining the networks that they, uh, that they oversee and to reduce the um, profit motive. The courts have ordered the company to pay out billions in compensation, and PG&E says it has changed its ways. I do think that many people who took part in that case um, feel uh, vindicated. Our entire business community and utilities need to learn how to adapt to a changing climate. ExxonMobil has long been criticized for allegedly hiding what it knew about climate change. A growing number of companies are facing legal proceedings linked to global warming, from allegations of misleading investors about climate risk to public nuisance claims. Between 2000 and 2010, about 20 climate-related cases were brought against businesses. But in the past decade, that figure has soared to around 120. Bankruptcy, negligence, indictments, um, loss of reputation, all these terrible, awful things are going to happen to more companies if they don't wake up and start addressing these issues. Lack of effective preparation for COVID-19 has contributed to devastation around the world. It's highlighted the importance of acting against climate change now, rather than waiting until the crisis worsens. 
But few companies are heeding this lesson. The longer we go without taking enough action, and the harsher the course correction is, then the bigger the stranded assets will be, economically and at a human level. Do we manage this, or do we screw it up? The only choice in front of us is to lean into the, the clean and the green economy. Not leaning in means economies that could be so severely damaged that what we see now as our global capital market would look fundamentally different. This is not an issue that anybody who thinks that they're a leader can just ignore, right? This is a fundamental uh, challenge for this century. And anybody who thinks they can sidestep it uh, is not really leading at all. Hi, my name is Guy Scriven. I'm the Economist Climate Risk Correspondent. If you'd like to read my special report about business and climate change, please click on the link opposite. If you want to continue watching our Now and Next series, click on the other link. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to subscribe.